Hey, what's up, bookworms? We are back with another interview with the author. And today, I like to call him my favorite Harkonnen, but he is actually <laughs> Richard Swan, the author of The Justice of Kings, The Tyranny of Faith, and the upcoming... Is it called The Ruin of Empires? Am I getting that it is not. It is not called The Ruin of Empires. That is an artifact um, from an earlier discussion I'd had with Orbis. Okay. Um, right. And they up, they were very quick to update the metadata on um, on uh, Amazon and, and Goodreads and things, but it, it has since changed. Um, and I think it may be a secret, so I better not say. Um, I think they're planning on doing some kind of... Re yeah, oh, so we're going to do like a, a big reveal? Yeah. Exactly yeah, that's that. Like, that's yeah, like, yeah. That's like the new thing now. I'm actually doing a reveal for orbit uh for uh what alexander darwin on thursday i'm doing a oh is that reveal. combat codes yeah combat codes yeah so I love that, a, that seems to be like a new thing you know i've been talking about for years mm -hmm. on my videos i would always make like these book trailer kind of ideas and I was, people yeah, are like, yeah. You, you should think about like doing that and, like selling to bookstores i'm like you should get out of the market for that now i'm seeing them like everywhere <laughs> i was like shoot i should have really gotten ahead of the curve yeah got on the ground floor on that they it's just become part of the kind of marketing e ecosystem hasn't it um, yeah you know, yeah well guys really in case you don't know uh i just mentioned those those two books he wrote he actually wrote a trilogy before that uh the art of war trilogy that was, that was that's gonna come up a little bit and i think oh, that's yeah. the start there what was it like for you uh really getting started in this business so you wrote art of war first and then yes. you is that when you got discovered by orbit is that how it worked no no not at all no um i i i've been writing for many many years um since my kind of like teens and um art of war came about when i i'd taken about a year or two off writing and um i did i discovered kdp you know the, the sort of self-publishing platform and i think it had been around for maybe four or five years at that point um and I was like, oh, amazing, you know, I can write a book, I can publish it, I can do the cover and all this stuff. And then it all seemed um, so tremendously exciting. So right. I, I wrote this book and I, and I self-published it. And I had, um, you know, I sort of did the initial kind of marketing and I built my Twitter account and all the rest of it. Um, and I had a little bit of success with it. Um, you know, it sort of ticked over for two or three, four years. And then by about 2019, it, it just died off completely. I never really did anything to push it um you know i never did the, the sort of the marketing grind that uh, you know it sort of requires um or it certainly has required for a long time now um and so it just kind of died off and i was like you know that was a fun experiment and i did a i did a military science fiction novel called um earth remembers and i published that in 2018 it was the last book i self published before i wrote justice of kings and um i sort of think yeah great art of war did quite well it did like 10 12 thousand 15 thousand copies whatever and i and i had nothing i did nothing to push that it just sort of happened so i presumed that would continue to happen for me and i and i published earth remembers and um and, and just nothing just absolute crickets um i think even to this day it's it's sold basically nothing um and so i was like that's you know that's enough self-publishing for me now i want to kind of realign to um my old my like childhood goal of you know trad pub so um a published author yeah 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 and so and so i wrote the justice of kings and um and from there it was fairly smooth sailing and i think you know orbit was never um orbit was never particularly they've never even brought up actually the art of war trilogy it's it's never formed part of the conversation they've never spoken about um wait a second you're british i had no idea <laughs> i am indeed Ooh, yeah yeah no i'm not australia i live in australia um uh, but i'm not australian nor am i american um, so would you um, ever tr think about uh say orbit said hey this art of war do you want to like polish it up and we'll release it would you ever consider that oh 100 yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, it's you know it's doing quite nicely now actually it's um it's uh, so as i said it, it kind of died off in about 2018 2019 and then it had about two or three years in the doldrums doing nothing at all and then you know justice of kings came out and um you know that's done very very well um indeed and so people are going back through my back catalog now so that's all upside for me because i take 75 percent on those books and so you are selling like you know a couple of hundred copies a month now um and uh and so yeah i mean absolutely they, they you know and they, i think they have potential so if all it was to send to, they definitely won't because i've got other books in the pipeline now but if they were to turn around and say yeah we'll have those for x sum of money definitely well, of course well see ryan i get confused because you're irish and you live in new zealand i think and, 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 right. and richard is british and lives in australia i can't we're I can't all expats that's but right yeah, i, I knew he was did... british that's why it was hard for us to get this together at first because i thought he was in uk time that's and he's right like, oh no i live in the future i live in australia that's right you know? it's it's 10 o'clock in the morning the day after you the yeah he gets to tell me the baseball score it's gonna be really great that's right yeah yeah do I... <laughs> <laughs> so uh let's talk a little bit about book number three is that going to be same you've had february february is it gonna be february 2024 
that's exactly right yeah and um it's uh it's going to be the same kind of hardback i presume goldsboro will do another edition of that i was a little bit annoyed actually they needed 750 copies of tyranny of faith because they sold out extremely quickly on pre-order so they kind of lowballed it a little bit um and that means a lot of people and it's so they and so they pretty good though right book two oh, it's it's, it's wonderful but they did so they did 2000 for justice and i think they didn't they did they did quite well i think they just sold hardcover maybe, that you're talking just yeah hardcover. yeah they, yeah with the sprayed edges and stuff and i think they did they sold maybe half just over half of those you know in week one or whatever but i think the rest took quite a long time to shift and so they um and so they probably thought oh, well maybe there's not the appetite you know for this series and so they kind of did 750 for um a uh <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, Ryan's. Hello, hello, Ryan. How are you? Um, uh, and then they did seven fifty for the tyranny of faith. But of course, in that in the intervening time, it, Justice of Kings had kind of picked up dramatically, and so now there's going to be twelve hundred and fifty people who won't be able to have the full set of right. you know God's Recovery. So it's a little bit annoying, but um, you know, it's still nice to get it, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's going to come out in hardback in in February, and it is not called the Ruin of Empires. I didn't like that title. I um. I thought I thought it was a bit trite, a little bit too um, banal. Um, and originally, I did agree to it. Um, Orbit presented it to me, or more or less, as a sort of fait accompli. And, I, and I, I've read like a billion books between them. What was the dog's name? In book Heinrich. Two? It's got to have something to do with his name. Come on, it has to. That's, that's the. <laughs> I want to put him on the cover. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> it needs to be on the I cover. Know. Yeah. I want. I wrote Heinrich in. Heinrich is based on my old black Labrador who died sadly mm. a few years ago. Um, and uh, and I thought I, I need to find a way of honouring him. So Heinrich is Henry. Is Henry? It's just mm. a German for Henry. Um, but you know the 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 character in book three. I don't think a lot of people would get um, the, guess the character for for book three. I've dropped a few hints, okay. but it's a little left field because we we struggled with it because obviously number one is Sir Conrad. Number two is Helena. Um, and you know there is a sort of a trio. I, mean, I can't really spoil. I don't want to spoil the books, but um, there isn't a nat there's no longer after book two. There's no longer a natural choice for book three because there aren't three of them. And we discussed originally having the both of them on there, um, but the, compositionally it looked really weird. Um, uh, your cover arts are awesome, so I'm sure whoever will be it'll look great. I and mean, that cover uh, art. Martina is, is yeah, yeah. Martina is signed up for book three, which is great. Um, Martina is. I think she's uh, Slovenian or Slovakian, um, and uh, she uh, does a lot of Magic the Gathering art. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so she's definitely been around the houses. She's she's you know, and, and in fact, she won a uh, an award, an, an illustrator's award for the Tyranny of Faith cover art. Um, you know, it was it was that well received, um, and so I'm really pleased that she's going to be doing the third one because. I absolutely adore. It's exactly what I wanted, which was fantastical realism, that style of mm -hmm. hyper real, but in an in an art in a painterly kind of style. Um, it's precisely what I wanted. When I look back at the covers, I don't really like the books, but when I look back at the covers of, say, um, uh, is it Terry Goodkind? Is Wizard's First Rules at Terry Goodkind? Yes, that read series, it yeah. Yeah. sort of truth. I read the first one. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of that series, but. Um, I read the first one, but the, the art, the cover art is, is wonderful. Um, I don't think it was Mike Whelan, but whoever it was, it was brilliant. And I love that style, that fantastical realism where it's... Do you hate that as a reader when the cover's awesome and the book is just... And you're like, damn, I wanted, I wanted to be great <laughs> because of that cover. <laughs> that I know. Cool. And it's becoming, you know, the cover art now is, is becoming excellent. It's, the, the, it's such a... What I would really hate is if they started cutting out human artists from the... The process. Oh yeah, oh yeah. The AI um, stuff is. I mean, whew. I, I, I mean, the, at first stuff. they're talking about going back and like editing books, and now they're just talking about, hey, why do we need author authors anywhere? What was AI? Oh my god. I, know. Yeah, it, I mean, and it's and and the frightening thing is, of course, is that it's still very much in its infancy. Um, I, it's like they never and, watched Battlestar Galactica. You know, I, I mean, yeah, it's bad. You it's love bad. that program. You've been tweeting about it for quite a while now. Oh, well, it's one of my favorite shows of all time. Yeah, yeah. It really, perfect. and it's aged I, beautifully. I think I looked for it in they had the in the shops here, and I could not find it anywhere. I couldn't find season one. I could find mm -hmm. season two or three or four, but I couldn't find season one. And it's not streaming on anything that I own. Um, I'm trying to sort of limit the number of streaming services I own because I don't know. Do they have streaming in Australia? Do they have internet they in Australia? Do. 
they get, what they do is they pack it all onto a steamship and it sort of sails around the <laughs> south south coast of africa and I they maybe they fit like some uh some, some like antennas on a kangaroo and let them hop around that's for right a while until they found a signal okay. <coughs> i Excuse used the me. same stereotypes when i had jay christoph on here so it, 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 jay's yeah. a wonderful guy yes i spoke yeah, with him the other day actually yeah yeah so um, i guess uh the, the i always get these questions to ask every author because i mean hmm. it's just it's it's boilerplate but you know what it's a great conversation what was your first sff read like the first one that you ever oh, read. Great question. The first one, I remember it very vividly. Um, it was um, Space Trap by Monica Hughes. Um, it's a, I was, I was in a light in a place in England called Winchester. Um, and I was in a library with my grandma and I saw it on the shelf. It was um, a, it was a, it's a very vivid image for a child. It's, it's a picture of a car, a sort of futuristic style car on a highway driven by a robot. And it's kind of like this red, sun sunlit you know sunset in the distance and it's about these kids who get they go into the middle of a maze on like an alien planet and the next thing they know they're teleported away and they appear in an alien zoo um they're captured and they appear in a zoo and it's basically about them trying to escape the zoo and the planet and to return home um and just absolutely consumes me this novel i i, I was just my mind i could always feel it expanding in real time as i read the book um and and that really started it. I was very young when I read that, and um, and from there it was uh, just a succession of science fiction, and ran, you know, random fantasy novels and things. So um, you say you leaned more sci-fi than fantasy? One hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I read loads of sci-fi, predominantly sci-fi, growing up. Okay, um, okay. So favorite huge... favorite sci-fi, not Star Wars. That's because that's someone that I, uh, Brent wanted me to ask you about. What's your favorite sci-fi? That's but not books. Star Wars related. What's that? Uh, so favorite sci-fi books or favorite yeah, sci-fi books. like IP? Oh no, uh, favorite... the Star Wars talk will dominate later, I'm sure. But hey, okay, uh, sure, prefer, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Favorite. I've book, got some, uh, I've got Star some controversial Star Wars opinions, so I'm looking forward to talking about. Oh, that. you got plenty of Lord of the Rings ones too. We're going to talk about them. <laughs> I've kept receipts. <laughs> uh, did you really? Yeah, you've just into the deep dive into my yeah. social media. Yeah. Um, I uh, so I loved um, the Ian Banks Culture series growing up. So um, you know, you my team said. Yeah, they were they were a hu hugely formative for me. Um, so um, you know, player of games, look to Winwood. Um, Use of weapons is probably one of my favourite books um, of all time. And I was also a really big um, Peter Hamilton uh, fan. So I read. Um, I was about fourteen. I read the Night's Dawn trilogy. I don't know if you have it. it. Haven't got you have it. it. Yet. They they're have a, it in massive books, man. Uh, Fifteen hundred pages a piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, they have they have in Goldsboro Books in Cecil Court in London, they have the three in hardback signed first edition, and also to go with it the hardback of the Confederation Handbook and the um, short story collection of Second Chance at Eden, um, all for a thousand pounds. And before I left the uk to come to australia i was just so close to just buying them but i thought i can't there's nowhere i can store them if i take them with me so it's a little treat for myself when i go home um so yes the night's one trilogy which is which is very much like a kind of epic kind of very space op militaristic space opera um you know cast of thousands um it's like zomb it's basically zombies like in space um you know the dead come back and they start possessing the bodies of the living and then they can you know they can shoot fire out of their fingers and oh, that sort of thing cool. But in a very kind of high tech, you know, ultra high tech, um, sort of post scarcity uh, sci fi environment. So it's really uh, cool. Peter F. Hamilton and, and um, uh, Alistair Reynolds are probably the sci fi I get recommended the most from my, my viewing audience. Have I read Reynolds. Now, obviously, I know him. What kind of things does he write? Because uh, I, I, I always get him confused with Baxter. Um, and there's a couple of others in that space, like, who were huge in like, the 90s, and they were kind of just churning them out. I lean more on the uh, the F than the SF, so I'm not really the, the one to ask. I mean, mm. obviously, I love like, Sun Eater. I love Dune. Uh, I, I really like the Expanse that I've read so far, but I'm still June, very... June. June. <laughs> what, am Dune. I saying Dune wrong? Dune. <laughs> you, oh, okay. So I'm Although I suppose Frank Herbert was American, wasn't he? So maybe it is Dune. Dune. <laughs> <laughs> We we in, in the UK would say June, um, but it sounds uh, like I you're saying it. tune. So I know. <laughs> <laughs> tune, uh, Dune, Dune. Um, I love Dune. I have the uh, Folio Society edition of the first Dune book, yeah. uh, which set me back 
the thick end of 100 that's, quid. That, that's one of my like nine copies of Dune. Yes. Yeah. I yeah, yeah, have yeah. a problem. Yeah. I have three actually. Um, I had a, a, a the, the, the folio was just to keep on the shelf. And it, it yeah, the folio, things. I looked at the art and then I put it back and yeah, said, yeah. I'm not going to yeah. read out of this. Yeah. No, no, no. And then I have a paperback that I can just throw around, you know, and read. Um, it's a wonderful book. I, I, I love Dune. I, I, my interest in the series uh, <laughs> dropped off. It's Dune. <laughs> yeah, I, I always Stand tell people, Jews. they ask my opinion like the, the, about the sequels, and I say, just stop at God Emperor. You know, that, that you're really not going to get much that you like after that, probably. <sighs> I mean, because I mean, Frank wasn't able to finish his stuff, and I won't even talk about what his kid did. But I, I think yeah. that three, if you're not enjoying yourself, I don't think that four is going to be something Definitely you're going to enjoy. It's not going to scratch that itch. Yeah. I, I, almost, I would stop at uh, Messiah personally, but uh, oh, that's wow, just me. Okay. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Dang, yeah, blasphemy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm on the See, guys, I told you he was a Harkonnen. See, he doesn't like where the story goes. <laughs> they made some very compelling points. Oh, oh me. man. So, what'd you think of the Dune 2 trailer? I'm excited for it. Um, I I loved the first movie greatly. I was surprised they ended it where they did. Yeah, me and Chris Rocky would... talked about that. That it was a weird place to end it. <clears throat> I really thought they were going to do more of the build up. <clears throat> so, I thought the first half was a little bit rushed. I actually thought that the first movie was going to end with the fall of House Atreides. Right. Yeah, that made the most um, sense. And then, and then the second half was going to be him um, amongst the Fremen. Um, but it but it wasn't. It kind of, he did a bit of Fremen. Um, and then it just sort of kind of ended. And I was like, oh. Um, and so did you read Tune on Tuesday? Yes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah, I'm Tuesday. excited for it. I mean, look, it's all my life. It's been, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's it's unfilmable. Just look what happened when David Lynch tried to make it. And, and I've been like, I just feel like if it gets in the right hands, and clearly it's in the right hands, someone who carries the paperback in his back pocket while he's directing the movie, obviously that's the guy you want making your movie. That's the person you want, yeah. You know? But that brings there's... me. I'm sorry, go, no, go on. No, no, you go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that brings me to smoke, one of the questions coffee. I got asked the most is, <laughs> have you been contacted yet? <laughs> well, well, while you die, have you been contacted yet about the adaptation of uh, Empire of the Wolf? I have indeed. Um, ah. So um, that the rights to that sold extremely quickly by complete chance. Um, my agent was talking to uh, a contact he knows, an American guy um, called Mike. It's not you. It's a good um, name, though. It's a good yeah, name. yeah, it's a great name. Very common name. <laughs> um, a guy called Mike. Uh, he's a producer. He does a lot of, he has done a lot of, um, like, top-tier kind of Broadway stuff. And he was looking to move into the kind of TV space. And um, Harry, who's my agent, um, sent him a couple of books. Um, one was um, a, non, like a non-sci-fi fantasy novel, and one was happened to be The Justice of Kings. And, and he just happened to love it. Um, and so he bought the rights to that. Um, and that was you know, extremely quickly. Um, so they re-upped on that in September last year. You know, I don't feel like it would really be super, super expensive to make. I mean... Well, according to... Excuse me. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> I, man, I've been struggling with it, too. I got green tea right now. So. I have a... I'm just coming out of a cold. And uh, I've got a tickle in the back of my throat. And it's driving me completely insane. Um <laughs> I am actually fine, but uh, it's just this tickle. Um, it, you know what? Apparently, it is. Um, apparently, it is expensive to make. Um, really? Okay. I according take it back. to, I just like you don't have you know big crazy dragons and you know crazy no, epic CGI stuff. You know, I just I, don't know. I think in terms of uh, fantasy filmability, sure, like because you could all, but you know the expense of um, <laughs> the expense of. <laughs> A, uh, a like for example, if you're filming a historical fiction, you know, piece like you know the Tudors or whatever. Actually, a huge amount of the expense comes from things like the costuming. Sure. Um, you know, it's there's a lot of. Whereas, um, I was talking to a guy I know about it recently because he writes a lot of screenplays and um, he got sort of got the inside track on what is and what isn't expensive. And it's quite, it, it was actually quite surprising what was and what wasn't expensive. And it's not necessarily what you would think. Um, but I agree, the Justice of Kings doesn't have a lot of big effects. I guess the necromancy scene would be the only real kind of, um, you know, thing to require. Yeah, you got kind of eldritchy in the, in the new book. So, yeah. I yeah, mean, yeah, it gets a I bit like more. That. And, you know, the third one is even more, actually. I really, really leaned into it, lent into it. I'm, I'm, I'm a Lovecraft fan. I'm always <laughs> down for more big, greasy, tentacly monsters in my story. So sure. I, you know, I love that. And I think um, 
I think in the first book, I wanted it to just be very unknowable um, and kind of spooky. Um, and then in the second two books, I kind of thought, oh, you know what? Um, I love this shit. I'm just going to do loads more. Um, and I bought a book. Um, it's an art book that I wanted to buy for ages. And it was out of print years and years ago by a guy called Wayne Barlow. He's an artist. And he did um, a series of paintings called Barlow's Inferno. And it was basically his visions of hell um, based on things like Dante and you know, other kind of medieval chroniclers. Um, and the, there are these fantastically disturbing paintings of the different landscapes and castles and, excuse me, sorry, <coughs> fortresses of hell. I'm going okay. <coughs> to do it help him out here, guys. <laughs> I'm oh, actually, you know, I'm so sorry. I'm going to grab some water. I'm going to no, be back I'm in fine. one minute. You hold the fort I, I, and that I might help me. Fine. A little. Yes, Albert. He did you just say, keep talking. Sure, sure. I, I do this a lot. Uh, he did say book three is coming out uh, February, just like the first two have. Uh, Richard apparently is very on the ball, and uh, he meets deadlines. So I think he's that Joe Abercrombie style where he wrote all three books, and then he kind of slowly edits them and you know, does rewrites and stuff during the uh, the time off. But yeah. yeah. Uh, Ryan, I think it might be it might be Whiskey 30 for Ryan Bang. right now. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, Ryan. Such a lovely guy, Ryan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. I can't, I can't wait to, to, to have him on here, guys. When you hear Ryan's accent, you guys are going to lose it. It's crazy. It's really, really crazy. Real Irishman. Traditionally, of course, historically, we're enemies. Um, oh, you're doing book plates. These days with her prints. I've oh, got, got some in front of me, actually. Uh-oh. Let's have a look. There you go. Yes, they're really cool. Um, I got them done by a, a lady called Hannah Elizabeth um, on Twitter, and uh, they go for five pounds a pop. I just get a little silver pen, and I sign them. Um, and they're really cool. I'm really pleased with how they turned out, actually. Um, it's just the heraldic device of the empire on there. So, so yeah. You have, um, do, you have, do you have it in your head when you write? Do you imagine any actors? Because, uh, you know, obviously as a reader, some of us do this. We'll just fan cast because, mm. you know, you ain't got to worry about budgets or any of that stuff. You can, you yeah. can be the writer, director, producer when you're making the movie mm. in your head, you know? Yes, of course. So you have any, any, any actors? Like, they give you a blank check. Say, so go out there and get <laughs> any actor you want to play I did, for Conrad. I, I, I did, yeah. I actually did a fan cast a little while ago. Um, I always imagined Mark Strong as Sir Conrad von Volt. He's probably a little bit old now because um, von Volt's supposed to be about 45. And I think Mark Strong's probably closer to 55. Um, but I always imagined Mark Strong, but kind of with long, kind of long hair. Who I, I imagine it's so weird because it does. I think it's just because I like that movie uh, Lady Hawk by John Graff. I was thinking of Rucker Howard, but I know he's too old now. But I was thinking about Rucker Howard, like how he looked back then. Yes, you yeah, know? yeah, I can see, and he's got the he's got the right accent as well. And I think that's have, just because I liked that movie so much when I was a kid. Yes, I don't know. yeah, yeah, like, okay. Um, you know what? Like, I mean, you can see almost any kind of modern lead, you know, actor, male actor, doing it really. Um, I guess it had to be British or do a very convincing English accent. Um, I actually like the idea of a foreign language adaptation. I think like a German. Like, did you did you ever watch Barbarians on Netflix? I did not. It's it's excellent. It's about um, it's it's basically about Ro- a, a Roman legion in um, the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest um, in in you know uh, uh, Rome like uh, Germania and um, it's very very but it's all in German or Latin or I guess Italian but it's brilliant. Um, I highly recommend it. And I was thinking like you know a sort of foreign language adaptation of Justice of Kings would also be pretty cool. Um, in terms of Helena, I, I always thought of, um, there's this German actress called Miriam Stein, who um, I watched her in Generation War, which is a uh, World War II, uh, it's a German World War II drama about five teenagers, or like, you know, young 20-somethings, um, and they all get sent to different, um, you know, parts of the front, so one of them gets sent to the Eastern Front, or a couple of them get sent to the Eastern Front, one is a nurse, one is a soldier, one of them gets, you know, shipped off to um the gas chambers um and, and it's, so it's quite it's quite dark it's not fun viewing but it's a very compelling story i find um, that those things are historically accurate they're usually <laughs> dark you know especially if they're you know the dark ages yeah yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah for sure uh for sure uh it's it's grappling with some pretty uh some big themes but um miriam stein is in that and she plays a girl called charlotte and i always imagine i thought she'd be a perfect um Helena, but again, much probably much too old now. She must be at least in her thirties and probably in her forties. Um, so uh, yeah, that's right. And then Bressinger, you know what? I mean, Pedro Pascal, the man of the hour. I think he'd be a great Bressinger, or you know, someone like him or Diego Luna. 
um, you know, someone like that. Uh, well, just help. make sure in book three you write in that he actually watches a baby or someone really, really young, and then Pedro Pascal would be perfect because apparently that's, that's his role. They're like, hey, we need someone who's like kind of a caretaker for someone much younger than him. Mm, it is, I'm guy. sensing a strong theme um, in his recent output, but I mean, I do love. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly tie a knot in the um, the TV talk because I don't think I finished. Um, but basically, the where it's currently at is they have writers attached, they have a pitch prepared, and it was going to go to pitch to the net, you know, the networks, the mm. networks, whatever that means. Um, in May, and and of course the writers' strike has um has just uh, put it off for now. So I think they're waiting until obviously that's all resolved before they they pitch it. So you know I think with all with, with these sorts of things, I just assume it won't happen. Sure. <laughs> no, when I talked to Joe Abercrombie, he told me that basically it's like everyone just was buying the rights up just so someone else wouldn't make it. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. just hold no, no intention to make them. I like you know it was like it wasn't nothing you know as well. I mean it wasn't. It wasn't retirement money, but it wasn't nothing for the uh, the option. Um, but I, I just assumed I just take it that as a, oh yeah, it's a nice bit of money in my pocket. But so uh, young writers, you guys listen. There's nothing to this. Richard's second yeah. book, he's got it made. He's done. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just, just that's <laughs> all, the, all the big money is in publishing. Everybody knows that. So uh, believe it or not, people are are anxious to hear some of your your Star Wars opinions. Uh, I was going to say the book stuff first. But you just want to yeah, kind of set it up here. Who has the all-time best character arc in Star Wars, and why is it Ahsoka Tano? Character, okay, who, sorry, who is the best character arc? Is because that's an interesting. That's not the same question. Who is is who is the best character? So is it who is the best character arc? Because I mean, that's it's that hard to, to not be. say Anakin Skywalker. It's but Anakin I mean, Skywalker, of yeah. course, it's Anakin Skywalker. Yeah, for sure. Like he has the best character arc, no question. It's almost Shakespearean. Um, and you know, in the hands of a better writer, that that could easily have eclipsed the OT. As the best Star Wars for sure. Um, I think this the script let Hi, down. Richard. What's your opinion on the Star Wars sequels? <laughs> I, I mean, are they they're hot? They're not hotter than mine. I mean, I don't think. I mean, I I, I, when, I was hating on that when everyone was still trying to pretend that the Last Jedi was a great movie. I was hating on it openly and didn't care. I didn't. Um, you know what? I I, I came out of the Force Awakens and I I just thought. That was just a new hope again. Like, why did why did I they was in just... denial for a little while? I was just like, look, at least it was watchable. <laughs> but yeah, I, mean, was... I go back and look at it now. I'm like, man, what was I thinking? <laughs> it was cool, but I, I kind of wish they had just done something completely different because um, I, 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 it was so much of it was just fan service, um, and I guess that's just a huge part of what Star Wars is now, anyway. But it was just a new hope again, and I was just like, I don't. Why did they do the exact same? Like in my head, if I was to write Star Wars. Basically, like at the end of the original trilogy, you've got you know, Luke. He sets up the Jedi Academy again, um, and uh, they've they've still got like what? Okay, they blew up the Death Star, but there's still like presumably thousands and thousands of stormtroopers and and stuff still out there. You know, they've all got to be either like killed or taken prisoner or you know reeducated or whatever. So in my head, it was like reestablishing the Republic and then like killing off or cutting out all of these other kind of holdouts from the empire i mean that's a rich scene of story right there and rebuilding the jedi order and then instead they were like no we're just going to do the, the new hope again and they were like oh the new and the, the new republic but then they just get blown up like almost off camera and i'm like <laughs> what, what was the point in that like you didn't need the first order you already had presumably like at least half of the empire left like why couldn't mm. they just fight them yeah and that's why when kathleen kennedy says oh we don't have like 700 page <laughs> novels to go off of i'm like what are these like 75 books i've got on my shelf yeah, yeah. over here are you kidding me yeah so. i didn't I that makes read... me think maybe you hired the wrong person yeah <laughs> i didn't you know what I, I didn't i didn't hate the force awakens as a movie i hated it because it was just like a reboot right. um, so i didn't i didn't like it for that reason and then the other two just annoyed me just because the writing was just crap um mm. you know it was all over the shop and there was obviously no consistency or kind of oversight through yeah. the, they didn't having, sit down and be like sitting down and writing a beginning middle and end for a trilogy <laughs> with a horrible plan hey, of course like well, like what could possibly have gone right with that approach like it was so silly and asked backwards i wasn't i didn't actually mind though this is controversial i didn't mind the I thought Luke Skywalker trying to murder Ben Solo was utterly ridiculous. I thought that was very silly. But I didn't mm. mind the idea of Luke becoming a hermit. Um, 
in and of itself, I didn't mind that concept, um, but I didn't think it was executed brilliantly. Um, yeah, now they're making a sequel to the sequels where Ray's going to rebuild the Jedi Order. You excited? I honestly just don't care about Star Wars anymore. I um, I haven't watched almost all of The Mandalorian. I didn't watch any of Boba Fett. I hate. I was really looking forward to Obi-Wan Kenobi. I was really, really looking forward to it. And it was just terrible. Like, just genuinely bad. The whole thing. Oh, no, just... no. I was one of those for years. <laughs> oh, look, I love George for what he created, but he's lost the touch. He needs to give this to new life, some new energy. And I thought, okay, it's going to be great. With Force Awakens, I think I was just like, look, they had to make that one movie to kind of correct the ship. And now we're going to mm. get to, you know, to the, the good stuff. And I was, I mean, you go back and watch the trailer for Last Jedi. That wasn't the movie that we got at all, but it looked awesome. Yeah. I was like, this is great. It's like everything I wanted. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I didn't like, there was a couple of things that really stuck in my mind. Is the last? Is it The Last Jedi? I just hated when the ships, they ran out of their sort of space petrol. And then you started drifting backwards. And I was like, yeah, it was like a less exciting they... pilot episode about Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but was... why are they doing that? That's not how physics works. Like, if they run out of space petrol, they just keep going. Look, I say all the time, forever. <laughs> people always ask me, Mike, do you have any interest in writing your own book? And I said, the reason I read is because I am a horrible, horrible writer. Mm. But if I can call out bad writing, it must be pretty, pretty, pretty bad because, I yeah. Said, I mean, uh, it was, it was silly things like that. And I think, um, I, I didn't like the way I didn't. Ray got a lot of hate because she was a woman. There was definitely an element of that. People just didn't like the fact that she was a woman, which is ridiculous. But what I didn't like about Ray was just as a character, we were just supposed to accept that she was immediately amazing. There was mm -hmm. no kind of no growth struggle. to her. Yeah. You know, she didn't have to really ever contend with anything. Um, she was just brilliant straight away. And it was the same, actually, with that dude who was supposed to be, oh, what was his name? He was started off as a stormtrooper, and then he kind of got sidelined quite quickly. John Boyega, um, whatever his character was called. And he's like fighting with a lightsaber at the end of at The Force Awakens. And I'm thinking, you can't just pick up a lightsaber and fight with it. Like, you just... Like he would get absolutely trounced by Kylo Ren extremely quickly. Like it's not, it's, you can't just pick up a sword and fight with it. You have to train. It's like it's like him picking up a saxophone and just playing it. It doesn't <laughs> work. It doesn't work that way. Um, so it, it was. I just find little. I mean, the the, the movies generally annoy me, but I it's just little bits like that. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I'm sorry. <clears throat> just really stick in my crawl. Oh God, this cough. Uh, with me, I just uh, after I watched Picard season three just happened and showed you can do fan service and write really, really well and make yeah. it actually like exciting for fans. And then I saw what they did with that. There was a moment towards the end of Picard season three where I was like, imagine this exact same scene with Han and Luke and Leia and 3PO and Chewbacca, everybody getting on the Millennium Falcon again. It would have been like, oh my God, it would have been like yeah, yeah. just tear city. And they just, they, they, put, how do you get? How do you get that cast back together and not even put them in a scene together? Who, who is the brain trust that made that idea? It's very silly that I felt it was all very squandered. Um, and they made Han Solo like very silly. Like he was Dead in the first. Dead. Yeah. <laughs> he was well, and also he was almost just like a slapstick character. Like in the first one, he was this kind of charming, roguish guy, but also like extremely competent. Um, and then in like the new the new trilogy, he was just like an idiot, like a bumbling moron. Like, I did, yeah, I don't know. They just, I mean, that's just been the trend for, for Hollywood out here in the West in the past decade. Is it's let's take everything that everybody loved back then, let's deconstruct it, deconstruct and say yeah. why it was not actually a good, good thing. And like, like you actually hear these things like that. They're actually surprised. They had no idea that Luke Skywalker was so popular. Are you kidding me? <laughs> how out of touch do you have to be to not realize that's one of the biggest pop culture icons ever yeah right. not, oh we didn't know people like luke skywalker that much wow this, that's just that's quite staggeringly i mean I, I just i genuinely wish george lucas would have just done another trilogy like right right yeah so i, I would have like, taken well, it guys be careful what you ask for you might get yeah i mean i mean i say this also as someone who like i love the prequels like i grew up with the prequels i was young now, that's where you're like what no no you don't <laughs> I will yeah, say, well, the sequels being so bad, it did validate the prequels as actual decent Star Wars movies. <laughs> I, I like Revenge of the Sith a lot. Now, look, my problem with those movies really isn't the story, but it's just the direction's poor. Like, I love George. He should have hired an actual director. 
and um, some of the acting is some of the worst acting I've ever seen in a major a major uh, motion picture like ever. I you know what I I I, can, I think I can appreciate their flaws and and still love them. Oh, it's, um, they make great they, memes. Great memes. They <laughs> they they I I grew up with them and they were so so Scott, excuse me sorry. <coughs> they were so. He's actually going to spit out a lung on this episode live, guys. I feel like I am. But I haven't been. I think maybe it's because I haven't been talking much in the last couple of days, and now my body just can't keep up with it. Well, see me it's once like, that thing says live, then I, you know, my my nose starts sniffling, and yeah, know, my goodness, oh. um, it's this is it's like someone's just got a feather and they're just tickling the very back of my throat. It's so frustrating. Um, Sounds like a torture uh, scene in your next book. I know. I'm sorry. This is going to be a, this is a dreadful interview. I'm just coughing all, all the way through it. I um I like the prequels. I I watched them again recently, and I was surprised at how well they held together. Um, the first two, because they get a lot of flack. Um, they get a lot of flack, but I think a lot of it is uh, because there are definitely things you can criticize about them, like very validly. Um, some of the acting is not great. Some of the writing is terrible. You know, the, the direction is there's a lot going on in Phantom Menace, but I don't think it's it's too much. Um, I don't like Jar Jar Binks, but I don't detest him like some people do um but i i do think they get unfairly criticized like they i think the problem was the expectation was so high that they just couldn't they were never going to be able to deliver um and so they got overhated as a result i'm with ryan here i feel like watching the clone wars animated series really fixed a lot of my issues with the prequels i was like oh okay so now i can actually because in the movies i was like I never see that Anakin and Obi Wan were ever friends. They're just like at each yes. other's throats. The whole trilogy, whereas on the yeah, yeah. on the animated series, they actually do build that up quite what quite, I'm on quite well. Season four of that now. I'm 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 very late to the party on the Clone Wars. Um, I, I missed the boat when I was growing up. Um, but I loved the Jendi. <laughs> do not do that. I love the Jendi Tartovsky, Tartakovsky, um, 2003 Clone Wars. You know the animated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. I loved that. Yeah, I like where Mace Windu is like karate chop in the entire uh, yeah, yeah. empire. It's great. <laughs> I because I was I was a huge fan of Samurai Jack, um, and it's the same creative team behind Clone, the original Clone Wars um, animated series. Goodness me, I'm going to cough again. <coughs> I can't get it up. Whatever it is, it, it, it's obviously nothing. It's obviously just like a nerve or something, just tickling away. Um, but there it is. We're just going to green tea, my man. Green tea. Come on, aren't you I English? Can't... <laughs> I never liked. I am, uh, and we have Earl Grey hot. <laughs> I know, just bre just English breakfast for me. I, I, I mean, I do like Earl Grey, but um, English breakfast is well. Well, I do Australian. got some. I do got some uh, some viewer questions. Uh, I, I feel like I should actually uh, uh, bring some of those up, and I, I think this one's a really great place to start. It says I'm curious about what the initial inspiration for the narrative structure of Elena retelling the story in the past tense. I can't remember. Reading a book before where the main theme leaned so heavily on the legal aspects of a fantasy world, it was refreshing and well done. No, oh, that's very kind. Um, I can tell you exactly what the initial inspiration for that was. Right. It was Imperium by Robert Harris. Um, it was, um, which is a phenomenally good book, by the way. Um, it's a, it's the story of Cicero, um, told over three volumes, um, and it's told it's fiction, um, but it's told in the voice of Tiro, who is Cicero's slave. Um, but in Roman society, he was more of a kind of, uh, I guess, like PA. <coughs> Excuse me. Man, it's like when someone else yawns, it makes you want to yawn. Now I want to cough. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Um, maybe it's the air. It's very dry. I know. Um, and so he was more like a kind of PA, like a secretary, like a confidant. And he tells the story of Cicero's life. Um, and the first book is Cicero uh, doing like a trial of another Roman. Uh, so Cicero is a lawyer. He was legal. He was, you know, he was a, as I was and am. Um, and uh, and and the first book is him. And so the the narrative structure. I was like, what a brilliant, what a brilliant way. Because I don't like. I wanted von Volt to be this kind of like this great man. I'll be of right history. back. Keep going. That's okay. Yeah, I wanted von Volt to be this kind of great man of history within the the the, the novel in the in the world in the world of the novel. Um, but I didn't want to get inside his head because I thought that that perspective would just not be as interesting. Um, you know, Von Vault is an interesting character to uh, view and to learn about, but I don't think he's an interesting character to hear from. I think he's much more interesting to be seen through a lens, especially because 
uh, across the course of the trilogy, Von Vault's character changes quite dramatically. And in the first book, he's a sort of paragon, or, you know, certainly what Helena thinks is a paragon. Um, and then in, in book two, he starts to kind of, and the question really is whether Von Vault is becoming worse or whether he's always been this way. And Helena is kind of just really seeing him for what he is. And so I liked that emotional distance and I liked having the character dynamic to explore between Helena and Von Vault, um, which starts off as a kind of very awkward mentor, mentee, apprentice kind of relationship and then strays into something much more um, ambiguous and complex as the series goes on. <laughs> because what I wanted to achieve with that was, um, I thought, you know, Von Vault is, is he's a powerful guy. He's a, he's a good looking guy. He is everything. He's every male role model to Helena. And she's had this kind of like very um, difficult and storied upbringing. So she's both quite uh, worldly, but also quite naive. And I, I, and I thought between the two of them, this very unhealthy, like an unhealthy, you know, attra uh, attraction would, would develop. And it's kind of like an exploration of that power dynamic. You know, Von Volt is a powerful figure in her life. She is vulnerable, emotionally vulnerable. And so, and I thought it was a very rich theme of, uh, of character growth to explore and a very interesting kind of way to kind of examine these characters. I don't think every, everybody necessarily clicked with that. I think some people thought that it was kind of like a, ro like a, a quote unquote romance, um, which isn't, I, it isn't really right. It isn't a romance because it's not supposed to be a romance. It's more of like an extrapolation and an exploration of their character dynamic. And it's not necessarily an endorsement of their, well, it isn't an endorsement of their relationship. It's more like if you had these two people in this situation, how would this relationship, you know, evolve? Um, so I definitely lost a few readers with, <laughs> with book two <laughs> and the way that went. <clears throat> I think you might be on mute, Mike. Yeah, uh, my drink exploded while uh, while we're doing that, and uh, yeah, I had to go get a towel and clean that up. So. Oh, there you go. Anyway, so this is just live, guys. This is amazing, isn't it? This is this is really really great. Uh, uh, that was three, one of my things that with, with book two. two when I was I was like, you know, I, I'm loving all the like I said, the Eldritch stuff is really cool. Mm. Uh, I loved everything that I was messaging you about, but I was like, man, I do not want a romance. Come on, man, what you doing? And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not like most fancy readers that are like, no, I can't have any romance in my book. It's not like that. I was just like, it's interesting. Not between these two. Yeah, yeah. I know. And, and you know what, like, and it's perfectly valid. And I think some people just didn't connect with it, but I think it was, some people just didn't kind of read it in the way i wanted it to be read i didn't want it to be read in you know in, in a way of like um like a, as i say i think a romance is the, is the wrong phrase for it because it isn't a romance it's a kind of like we're both in this kind of very you know high adrenaline high stakes situation we have this very unhealthy power dynamic um you know how would this situation sort of develop and it was just another layer you know it was another layer to the characters another layer to explore um, and also, you know, and, and, and at the same time, some people did want it to happen. I, it, it, one of my editors did like, um, so I had two editors for the first two books and, um, one of them was like, yes, you know, I wanted them to kind of fall in love with each other. So, you know, horses for courses, right? It's just people want different things from a novel, but, um, <coughs> it was never supposed to be like a kind of, yay, Helena and Von won't get married and run off into the sunset. It was more of a. Man, their relationship is so fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but uh, I guess some people probably thought that I was trying to kind of make it into a, a sort of lovey-dovey thing, and I, and I just wasn't. This is, I guess, Albert's asked this question a few times. This is intended to be a trilogy only, right? You're not. It's a trilogy. Yeah, yeah. It's it's finished. It's all done. Uh, I'm the copy edits on book three are coming back soon. Um, and and it's not a series. It's definitely a trilogy. It's definitely finished at the end of book three. Um, I um. Uh, do you plan well I mean I mean so, so the, the, the conversation about my next book series because I've got three I've just dumped three projects on orbit basically and I said take just pick uh, if you can have any or all of them um but if you don't want them we'll shop them to other publishers right, right um so contractually obviously they have first refusal on my next piece of work um so that reading is happening now so my next the, one of my fantasy series that i'm writing at the moment is a standalone trilogy it is set in the empire of the wolf world but it is set two centuries after the events of 
the first trilogy. So it's a flintlock fantasy, um, and it's kind of like uh, dealing with some of the fallout of the first book, but in a way that's completely narratively ring fenced from it. Because um, I love flintlock fantasy, I love it, and um, I've always wanted to write one. So that's my next fantasy trilogy, if it gets bought. <laughs> but I've You're also got that method of a. Uh... Uh, am I am I right in assuming that you had this story kind of like at least mapped out all the way before you released book one, so you knew you could release one per year? Is that the style of writer you are? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do, I do do that. I am quite, I am quite fast writer as well. So, um, you know, uh, I mean, book three isn't even published in the first trilogy, and I'm already sixty thousand words into the next into the next book. Wow. So, um, yeah, we'll see what happens with that. Um, but yes, I do have it all mapped out um, for sure. My, I, so my idea with the Empire of the Wolf series, the whole, as in, the, it's like a trilogy of trilogies, right? And each trilogy advances the world like a couple of centuries. And so the idea is that like the first one is medieval or kind of very late medieval, a more like early Renaissance really. Um, the second is like, the 1750s so like a french and indian war type. oh sweet so we're gonna be like doing like a sweet 1990s like throwback like it'll be like like and then rocking well, and then, shirts and shit it's gonna be great and then yeah and it's like so it's all these tricorns and muskets and stuff <laughs> and then um and then i want to do the basically like a sort of very late 19th century kind of early 20th century like almost like world war one okay um and then end it there um because i think then you start to get into weird when your magic and your technology starts to interact in weird ways, it becomes very difficult then. So you're gonna you're gonna successfully <laughs> transition your fantasy series into a sci-fi series like Mistborn is gonna do, huh? Well, I am writing a sci-fi series alongside it. So at the moment, I write my fantasy series in the morning and my sci-fi series in the afternoon. And I've got um, so I'm hoping to sell a sci-fi series as well, which is completely separate. It's a completely new, separate trilogy, um, and that will be about a um following a colony an extraterrestrial colony from its inception <clears throat> to its like you know a woman basically a woman inherits a just obscene amount of money and she escapes this kind of fascist empire to set up a new world literally a new world and how that world grows from literally the first broken ground to this kind of ecumenopolis and how this fascist empire kind of comes and tries to sabotage it and over the course of however many books I'm very very excited about that trilogy i really love it um and so i'm writing that as well so all but have that and then the third thing i, I sent them is a post-apocalyptic novel um <laughs> definitely a market for that i think yeah 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 for sure um, quite well yeah. well you say that though so really interestingly when i first um pitched it well i've written it it's the in fact of all the three projects this is the only book that's completely complete completely complete um and it's only a sh short book it's only he's a writer you guys completely complete. yeah that's right i'm good with words <laughs> oh, oh i saw someone say that i oh something really annoyed me the other day i have a huge vocabulary i genuinely do have a very large vocabulary and someone accused me of using a thesaurus for the justice of kings i was oh it absolutely enraged me i was like no it fucking didn't like it's, <laughs> i know these words like, is it my i said that when i was reading a uh, dark age by pierce brown a, a friend of a friend of mine we were reading at the same time and we're like did pierce brown have like a word of the day calendar and he said no matter what i'm writing i gotta work that <laughs> word in because i'm like uh -huh. some of these words i'm having to like you know you, you press and hold on your kindle and it gives you the definition because like i have no idea what that yeah. word means so yeah yeah I, I got, i've got a, quite, a weirdly good with the cat i don't really know why it develops but maybe it's to do with being a lawyer i'm not sure um it could always about being a lawyer so you have to use very you use very precise language um and you know so well a good example of that is the word obliterate right so we think of the word obliterate to mean a gigantic explosion or you know something is, is destroyed the actual meaning of obliterate in a technical sense means to like obscure a word um so like i've been in a trial where a whole a, a photocopied hole punch has has covered up the, the first half of a word and so that word was obliterated um so you know maybe it comes from big lawyer but um i wrote this 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 sci this uh, dystopian post-apocalyptic novel set in the uk after a kind of <coughs> sort of something it's almost like a religious apocalyptic event has happened i got great feedback from some some author friends of mine really very enthusiastic feedback everybody bloody loved that book um and uh everyone was just so tepid on it my agent was really tepid on it orbit was super tepid on it 
they were like post-apocalyptic doesn't sell at the moment no one's buying it really wow yeah like they just they i so i wouldn't be surprised if they did just didn't buy it um which is a shame because i think it's one of the best things ever you could always fall just... back to sexy teenage vampires i mean that, that that seems to be really really well that's right yeah i could just shove some sexy lesbians in there which seems to be very much hey, the, hey, uh, how's the your how's smut game going because i know that like sergey moss has made a great career out of smut fantasy mm. so you know you can always you can always have that fallback in... option in the new in the new stuff a few sex scenes in there yeah i th- you know sex scenes are a weird thing because a lot of people don't like reading them um i think it's all about the execution um you know i like i i would never have a sex scene just for its own sake it would have to be serving a purpose in some way <laughs> like it'd have to be advancing the plot in some way <clears throat> um i'm good so with the, the old-fashioned fade to black you know what's happening you fill sure. in the blanks you I, don't want I, to see I'm a bit of flesh on flesh no I Jay Kristoff because I'm like that dude. That dude has, he's read some smut mo- novels for sure. Yeah, and that's what yeah. he told me that he read like a stack of his wife's erotica novels, and that's how really? he got so good at writing those scenes. Because I was like, <laughs> he's got the kind of scenes like when I'm reading it, like at work, I was like, like looking around, like does anybody know what I'm reading right now? This is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. No, I've um, I've got a few, sec- but I like I, I like writing really weird and awkward sex scenes. I I find that very satisfying, uh, almost quite revolting ones. Um, so uh yeah yeah this, joe abercrombie does that very very well like it'll make you as uncomfortable that. as it is him probably writing it it's a great question because i don't I, I i don't even know what flintock series would you recommend i don't think i've ever read flintock fantasy so fatal fantasy um uh i mean powder mage is the big one that everybody recommends right. isn't it um, on my shelf mm-hmm. yeah um <clears throat> i read the first one of those many many years ago um now gosh it must be at least 10 years old um, I think that's kind of like fairly sort of the quintessential. But I mean, <coughs> I've been reading, um, you know, China Mieville. I guess it's technically flintlock fantasy because they do have muskets in those books. Um, if you read any like, you know, Perido Street Station or The Scar, which are exquisitely good books and exceptionally long and very nihilistic, um, but I highly recommend them. I don't know. I'm I'm simple. I like my swords, my shields, my dragons. You know, my prophecy. You know what? A lot of people like that. You know, there's been a big bounce back into that kind of classic '90s style, epic fantasy. You know, it's it's making a bit of a resurgence. Um, of, you know, people are kind of it's it's very cyclical, isn't it? Um, I think this looks like a sick. complicated question. You mentioned okay. that you outline and plot. What does the initial plotting outline process look like? Do you start at world building, characters, or plot and story? I do it all. I do it all. All at once, huh? Everything concurrently. Uh, I, um, it's a really, it's an excellent question. I think everybody's process differs slightly, but basically, um, the very first instance is I have a, I have like a, you know, Google Keep, uh, that kind of like, it's like a little notepad on your phone. And I just add words, I add words and ideas to that over the course of many months. And then when I'm ready to write a new book, <laughs> when I write a new book, I go through Google Keep and I like, right, here's the book. I have a rough idea of what the kind of the, the, the shape the story needs to take. I've been writing for a very long time, so I'm kind of um, quite well practiced now in fleshing out, like of following the knowing what kind of story beats need to happen and when and when something needs to kind of reach a climax and when it doesn't. Um, and so I literally open a Word document and I just get numbered paragraphs and I start like, you know, planning the chapters out. And then separately to that, I, I build the world, I, I, I draw the map, I build the world. I decide what you know the flavor of the world and I, I you know fill it out quite a lot um because the, the great benefit of doing that is um once you have the once you build the sandbox you you can then write you know you write within the sandbox quite easily so before i started writing empire of the wolf <coughs> i was reading about the holy roman empire the late carolingian empire i was looking at maps of like the confederation of the rhine or the you know, um, well, the Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> um, I was, you know, so I was looking at the nomenclature and the, the toponymy. I was, I did like the royal lineage, the family tree going back. I thought, what, what's the national dish? You know, what's the kind of, what's the national song? What do they drink and eat? You know, what are their, I, what are their kind of mores? I decided to make them quite Teutonic, so they're quite reserved. They don't like big displays of you know emotion in public it's crying is very frowned upon you know um so they're quite a reserved people so how does that kind of feed into their characteristics so von volt is a very reserved man he's not given to great emotional displays because he's very sovereign 
Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, the, di this, the dynamics between the different countries. So, you know, I had to kind of give each country a little bit of flavoring. So, you know, real life examples are a great, you know, I looked at a lot of Slavic names and, and um my wife has, has lithuanian heritage so that was very useful um I looked at other baltic states and, and different kind of slavic countries and looked at their names and the meaning of their names and stuff when i was drawing the map so you know i build the sandbox i plan the story and then the plan goes through dozens of iterations um dozens you know you could look in like the archive folder and it's got like old plan plan two plan three plan two, final plan whatever final plan version 10 um and then when i've got to a place where it all works start writing it very rarely do i deviate from the plan um very very rarely and then but i but i give myself enough wiggle room you know so if i want to change something i can and then once i finish the first draft it's like it's more or less there you know this i don't do a huge amount of editing um you know it's it's pretty good to go at that point again uh, guys this is easy this is it's all easy it's not a, it's practice mike is what it is it's just practice i've been writing for like 20 years um you know and it's the, easy now guys it's easy it's now, easy now. <laughs> exactly it is it is easy now like in the same way i could pick up an electric guitar and just you know strum out a few chords because i you know learned to play the guitar over the course of 15 years um you know it's it's just practice that's mm. all it is i'm not suggesting i'm the best writer obviously i'm not um but you know, I got to a stage of competency at some point in the last ten years, and now I can just hit my stride with my writing quite quickly. Um, well, I'll say as readers, really... uh, we appreciate that. We appreciate authors who don't leave us hanging for dozens of years. <laughs> no names. <laughs> no names. Yeah, we, do, we do appreciate that, you know. So the, the, the authors that write really fast, like since he's here, I'll go ahead and mention uh, 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 Ryan, who's putting out fifteen hundred page books every year. What? What? what <laughs> Okay, sometimes it might be one of those things where, like, you might be too dedicated to your craft when you're able to do that. So I think it's, you know, what I, it, but a part of a huge part of that, I, I also could do that. Um, it's the publishing schedule that holds me. Yeah, up. yeah. So say when you turn it in, usually it's almost like a nine month to twelve month turnaround, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, Justice of Kings that got sold in August 2020. Well, I think um, COVID knocked everything back a peg from the publishing side for a bit there, right? It, yeah, it, you know, what? I was very nearly published during COVID, actually. And I remember thinking at the time when I, we sold it, like, oh, God, 2022, that's so long away. <laughs> um, but what a blessing in disguise that was. Uh, this books. is a good question here. I don't know if he means archetype or if he means Empire of the Wolf. He says, what's your favorite and or most challenging character to write, unless it's spoilery? Most uh, interesting. Um, I think... I, you know what, Claver is is tough to write. Um, I find villains uh, not difficult to write, but a challenge in making them. Hello, Mike. Not Mike. Alan. <laughs> Hello, Alan. You're Mike. Um, I, you know, making Claver um, annoying enough that people hate him. You know, and making him like just a really annoying little kind of Weasley asshole um but also making trying to avoid uh just making him like a very tropey kind of over the top silly villain um was a very fine line to walk and i'm not sure i succeeded to be fair i think he's um i think claver is probably fairly archetypal but to be honest with you the story isn't about claver really um you know and, and it never was um the story is about helena and von Vol, um and their relationship and um everything else you know feeds into that of course but it's um it's not really about von volt versus claver so much as <clears throat> von volt and elena's relationship are dynamic throughout the the trilogy and um, that was always the focus for me and, and, and for me the most interesting thing i don't like writing huge battles i don't i don't find it interesting to read about them i don't find it interesting to write them um i don't find huge armies clashing on the field hugely engaging um from either side of the fence i have written them because i think there's an amount of expectation in epic fantasy that 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 takes place but um it's certainly not my preference i yeah, might do the talking to... that's happening over here we're yeah, yeah focus, exactly we're gonna focus on this leaf so <laughs> yeah <laughs> did you did you guys go to that bat the bat oh my god <laughs> oh i missed it um so yeah you know i like the slower kind of the talky the thinky the maneuvering the sort of the more machiavellian um you know so that's my that's my preference 
I'm with place. you, Benjamin. I, I I don't have to cough at all now. I want to cough. So it's like when someone else is someone else is yawning. And you, and, and you know, it's it's I am getting thing. a little bit better. It's, it's weird how this funny. works. Uh, someone kept asking, uh, "Do you?" I, I, I'm sorry, I missed the question. I saw I saw it. Uh, here it is. Uh, how do you handle missing your favorite characters when you're finished writing a series? I guess that kind of ties in with like, is it hard to kill a character off, or is it something? It, it is. No, no, I don't enjoy killing characters at all. Um, I don't like doing it. And when I did do it with one of the characters at the end of Tyranny, I was very upset. <laughs> um, but it has to happen to a degree. I think, um, you know, you want the stakes to feel real. Um, and, um, you know, you think about um, Maverick, uh, you know, not Maverick, Top Gun, the first one, and obviously Goose dies. And it's like a... It's the bit that everybody talks about, you know, it, it has big emotional weight, has big emotional impact. It kind of defined the film and it defined, you know, Maverick as a character. And so the death of characters can is an extremely important part of, you know, fiction writing and um, not something to be shied away from. But I'm not cavalier with my characters' lives necessarily. I don't hugely enjoy doing it. Um, you know, you build up so much <coughs> time and investment in writing them. And it's, she seems like a shame to kill them off, but uh, it's got to be done sometimes. Yes, yeah, forty-year-old <laughs> spoiler, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, mean, dude, I, I, I still won't spoil like <clears throat> the Hobbit, and I'm like, dude, that my my come on, my grandparents were younger than me. Yeah. Book, you know, it's like, come on. Uh, I think but, ten uh, years and and you, you're golden. I think anything else, anything after ten years, that's on you. You're a gamer, right? Oh, yeah, I got an Xbox uh, Series X. Yeah. Okay. Here's my question. Uh, I got. Uh, I just got a PS5, and this question is saying now that I got a PS5. This will be my last mm -hmm. video. Uh, no, uh, because I haven't taken out the box, guys. Because a new Zelda game just came out, and I've been a Zelda uh, okay. fan since I was like six. And whenever a Zelda game comes out, the world stops. You know, it's just we we've been you putting this off for for like about a month now until we we're both available. And uh, he said, "Well, I'm coughing a lot." And I said, "That's fine. We'll be fine." We'll be fine. Let's just go ahead and do it. But to answer your question, no. But uh, oh, see, I get crap because I said I didn't want to buy a next gen console for the longest time. It was like, what's like the must have game, you know, right now that I get? They're like, oh, they, 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 this one, this one, this one. I'm like, oh, you mean all those ones I can get on my PS4 or Xbox One? Oh, like, yeah, yeah, but they have 60 frames per second. <laughs> Whatever. The That's not worth $700. It, no, I, I sort of agree with you to an extent. My gaming is, I just have time to do much gaming anymore. Um, well, but, no, you're uh, writing like 3,000 words a day, man. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's like too small. Just, just children, to be honest with you. Um, the two small children, but... Um, yeah, they'll get you. <laughs> yeah, they'll get you. But I, I, I do, I mean, I've always been a huge Halo fan. It's literally the only reason I have an Xbox. Because I had a PlayStation and a PlayStation 2 when I was growing up. Um, but then I, I wanted, uh, I think it was Halo 3 or something in my late teens. Um, so my parents got me the 360. Uh, and I'm a huge Halo fan, so... I always buy the Halo games when they come out. I do have a, not a question, but a comment that's gaming based. It says, I would like Richard to know that one day he will pay for his crimes against the Krogan. <laughs> Is that Alan? <laughs> uh, I don't remember. I, said it, but I don't think it was Alan, but no. It would have been Alan. Uh, uh, look, sure. I have done both ways on Mass Effect. I think I, I played Mass Effect 1 and 2. Yes, I think both as as, as regular Shep and female Shep. I played it Paragon as, as a bad guy. I did every single way imaginable, and then like yeah, three yeah. came out, and you know what happened with that. But uh, so yeah, I've done I've done both ways with the Krogan. So yeah, you know, I've cured the genophage. I, uh, you know, I've done all the. No, I I let the genophage. I I mean the first one is still my favorite, but I I yeah. definitely I played the first. I played all three though, and I <clears> um, I, I I think I've said this before, but I got I got a weird kind of because I killed Rex gleefully yeah that's that's in, that's, uh, that's pretty that's pretty monstrous man <laughs> i he says that i hate right play annoys me like i said guys like i said <laughs> controversial that's right <laughs> secretly, secretly an evil person i hated rex um i killed him at the earliest opportunity i did not wow. bury him i th threw his body into the sewer um and i think because i did that and then because i did some a few other kind of niche things i got the i got the special you know how the big decisions in in the third game if you look at the decision tree, like Bioware published, it's really interesting, actually. Every um, big choice has like two major ways it can go, but also like quite an esoteric third way, depending on if like a whole bunch of random stuff has fallen into place. And because I killed Rex and because some other random stuff had happened, I got like a really weird third option with the genophage where I decided not to cure it. Um, so I let all of the Krogans die forever. Um, 
but then something else happened. Like, I still got to keep Morden Solus on side. Or maybe Morden Solus died. Maybe he died as well. I was quite happy to see him go as well, actually. He was a bit annoying. I just took Garrison Legion on every single mission. Um, that was it. Garrison Legion. Yeah, I got the Legendary Edition on, uh, I guess, like the, the remaster, you know, because I would yes. say that those games, those games had like a little bit of jank to them, you know, so if they fixed that, sure. I don't really know. I have it on Game Pass, have it play. I try to get my 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 youngest to play, or I'm sorry, my oldest to play it, but he's yeah, yeah. such a different gamer than me. He's uh, right. he's the speedrun nation, where he's got to do everything super quick. Really? He, ain't, he ain't got time for any storyline or anything. That's like, he's playing the new Zelda, and he's like, I don't know where to go. I'm like, well, have you listened to what anybody's telling me? He's like, no. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I didn't, it's, like, I didn't I, listen to him in the last game either. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the absolute opposite. I will boot up The Witcher 3, The Wild Hunt, and I will spend like... 45 minutes just like walking around riding around Talking everybody doing a little contract here and there just enjoying the feel of the world what was I'm, your I'm what was your primary childhood console i know where you're younger than me so what was your primary i am younger than you i had a playstation when i was 11 but okay. i was i was a, i did a lot of pc gaming as well i was hugely into rts's so like tiberian sun starcraft oh um, you must construct more pylons Exactly that. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm glad I never really got into the PC gaming until later in life because I, I here's what, what actually prevented that from happening mm. and not letting it take over my life was the roommate I had when I was 20. Yeah. Uh, he got EverQuest. Right. And, and he got so addicted to it, he quit his job. He no. broke up with his girlfriend. And no. then all of a sudden he couldn't pay his rent anymore. And oh it was like, dude, what in the world is wrong with you? That that was my my lesson of okay, I'm not getting into online gaming because I was I remember really that. wanted to try World of Warcraft when it first broke out. That happened oh. with World of Warcraft. I was think I was must have been <laughs> like 17 or 18 when that came out, maybe a bit younger. I can't remember now. And I remember reading all the stories of people like dying. Playing like you know, first, <laughs> you know, just they got so obsessed with World of Warcraft, they just didn't drink anything. It's just, it's just stupid stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I do like the kind of the big open world stuff. In fact, to, to the extent now where I don't really like non open world games. Anymore. Yeah, it's tough for me. Like, uh, they're trying to sell me on the new Final Fantasy game, and I was like, look, I ain't liked Final Fantasy since like fucking nine was probably the last one I really, really liked. So I think I was yeah. out, and then they were trying to sell me. So I was like, okay, I'll look it up and see, because, you know, got a PS5 now, and I'm like, again, I still don't <laughs> think there's any, like, must-have game. Okay, Final Fantasy 16, that's exclusive. Let me look it up, and the first thing they say is, well, they decided not to do an open world. And I was like, oh, man. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I, I love it. Witcher, Skyrim, I mean, it's, it's tough for me. Horizon Zero Dawn, it's hard for me not to yeah. play open world now, you know? So, no, that's it, because uh, I played uh, the first Jedi, not Jedi Survivor, maybe it was Jedi Survivor, whatever it was. Um, when it came out, like, it. Two years ago, yeah, a couple years ago, yeah. yeah, yeah, and um, and it wasn't open world. I thought for some reason I was expecting it to be, but it wasn't, and I was like, Ugh. it was quite a cool game, but I only got yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, look, the it. fact that it was a good EA Star Wars game, I was like, look, let's just count our lucky stars at even. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, you for know? sure. Was... Yeah, I have... <laughs> no, I was more of like a Total War guy, you know, and um, I love the Total War series on PC, you know, um, your Empire and your Shogun and all that sort of thing. <laughs> That's a very good point. <clears throat> Maybe I've got the genophagia now. It's um, <laughs> it's calmer. Well, uh, hey, can we talk about your monstrous Lord of the Rings takes? And your yeah, do I have Lord any take? Your monstrous Lord of the Ring take was when, and yeah. I had just like had to take a step back and be like, "What is this guy talking about?" Is we'll when on. you said you pref you were probably the only Lord of the Rings fan who, mm, but huge fan as well, that appreciates the theatrical version over the extended versions. Uh, uh, now, there's an important point of clarification here. Is there an asterisk that I missed? Okay. The theatrical cut of specifically the Fellowship of the Ring. Oh, that's the best uh, one. That's the best one. It has that's the best. Except, to me, with Return of the King, some of them are like, all right, some of these could have went. Yeah, some of the. Humor that, no, so Return of the King has the Mouth of Sauron in the extended edition, which was way it, better. It, it, it has the uh, the made up Death of Saruman, the made up version. You know. Yeah. Um, it misses all the Death of Saruman out. I wish they'd done the scaring of the Shire. That would have been awesome. Um, but I was I, think... I was the hot take that I didn't care about no Tom Bombadil, and I was fine without the scouring of the Shire. I always felt like that fourth act kind of brought Return of the King down a little bit. Sure. Fair enough. I mean, it would have been cool to see on screen, but I could definitely see how it was. You know, what, what extended scene in Fellowship of the Ring do you not like? The whole opening sequence. Oh, was, you didn't like they made the prologue worse. seven minutes long. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, so the prologue is fine, but what I mean specifically is the bit when um, – when uh, Bilbo is writing and Gandalf is arriving into Hobbiton, 
Um, oh, so concerning my, Hobbits, okay, yeah. Concerning Hobbits is much better in the theatrical cut. I think it's much tighter and cleaner, and much and the acting is a bit better as well. I think some of the acting in the extended scenes is a little bit off. Um, the <laughs> the Moria scene, the extended Moria scenes, they're no good. Um, I just think it's a much cleaner, better. It's edit. been so long since I watched because, like, when I got the extended version, I was like, "That's great." I gave away my theatrical one. I was like, "So I've never watched it again." I was like, "I'm never going to watch sure. it again." So I don't even sure. some of these things. I don't even know what is extra and what is not anymore. I, it's just like the mithril, the mithril scene. Is that about the only the Moria? Yeah, there's a few. I mean, to be honest with you, like, it's been. A, I watched. So I watched. I got the VHS of the Fellowship of the Ring. Ooh, all right. Yeah, so I'm not. You know. Uh, no, I think no you're old enough chicken. to have a VHS. <laughs> uh, yeah, no spring chicken. Uh, right, the TV I had in my room growing up was one of those like big cubes that had the built-in VHS player. Um, and then obviously mm. the DVDs on my PS2. Um, I got so the VHS of the and then and then so this this is this dates me. So I had the VHS of the Fellowship of the Ring, but I had the DVD of the Two Towers. So we Ooh. really were at that transitory stage. Yeah. Um, and I and I played the Fellowship of the Ring so many times. That not only could I recite the entire thing from memory, every single word of every single okay. character, um, but also the sound went on the on the tape. Um, you know, I just I I would get home, I would turn it on. It would be background music, no, and so I can't. You know, as much as I love the Fellowship of the Ring, and it must be one of my favorite movies of all time, I know it so intimately now that I actually like yeah you know, I can't really stand to watch it anymore because it doesn't engage my attention in it in any way. Um, because I've just watched it probably literally 50 or 60 right. times in total. Well, my kids um, liking it. It's become like a, we do the the extended trilogy over the summer and do it again over Christmas. Cause I think like it's, it's kind of like unofficially like a Christmas movie to me, it's just because each Christmas one movie. came out Christmases for three straight yeah, yeah, years. Right. So I just do it like every Christmas, but yeah, that's one of those, those trilogies were like star Wars or like a back to the future, Indiana Jones, where I could put it on mute and not only recite the dialogue, but also yes. like whistle the music. <laughs> so I yeah, exactly. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Like so, when Duel yeah. of the Fates starts in the fence of menace and you're just like, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, it's exquisitely good. But yeah, I think that was pretty controversial. Actually, some people were unhappy, but in like a silly way. Yeah, you but you know what? It's the internet. You can always find people who are going to My goodness. That you have a hot take. You can find 20 other people on the internet that will mm. agree with your hot take, honestly. Yeah, so, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I I mean I said something I'm watching The Last of Us. It's um it's one of the only things I'm watching. Well, I'm watching The Last of Us and I'm watching Succession. There may be two TV shows I'm watching them. Great, man. Yeah, it's good. They're both brilliant. <laughs> I really well, like The Last of Us. Well, Succession's great. Oh, you know, I don't like The Last of Us. Do you not? Uh, I love it's it. Not just because of, because of the uh, the game. It's just like my, my wife hasn't played the game, and she's like, she had like all these problems, and I think that maybe just was just like a huge like eye opening thing to me. How much of this am I liking just because I like these characters already from the game? Oh, you know, I, I haven't played. Like I feel like it was rushed. I felt like it was rushed. Like there's big Did events, you? like like Sam and Henry. It was like they're really going to do this in one episode. You know that was stuff. I was like they could have done that over two or three episodes. I don't know. I I didn't know. So I've never played the game. I've yeah. never played it. I didn't have a PlayStation. Um, so I've never played it. And I well, that's why um, I understand maybe, people people are like maybe that's why I liked game. it so much. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I guess like you know with all these things, especially something like The Last of Us, which is like big budget, they've got like big names attached to it. So Pedro Pascal must be commanding a pretty hefty fee these days. There's some CGI in there, which is not cheap. They've got some big sets in there, which they've got to build. Like, you know, they're going to go all out on season one. They, they, I think when they make these like prestige TV shows, I just assume they're only going to get one series out of it. And so they're just trying to chuck in as much as they can. But I actually really liked it. I thought it was great. Um, I love the chemistry between Joel and Ellie. I think she's a brilliant actress. Um, and I love what they did with her with the kind of the joke book. You know, she's got the books full of jokes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought it was a wonderful way of like humanizing her and making her very relatable because like I thought her character particularly was very well done <coughs> because she's she's grown up she's she's only ever known the post apocalyptic world so she's both very naive but also horribly world weary and I, and I think I like that because that's kind of like where I kind of kind of where I get to with Helena as well in in the Empire of the Wolf you've got these these characters that exist in two conflicting states simultaneously and i thought they did it and and the, the book of jokes was a brilliant way of 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 making of reminding us that she's basically a child and she finds these silly jokes really funny um and uh, and yet at the same time they exist in this world of unremitting horror um and so <clears throat> I thought I thought it was brilliantly done. I really liked the series. I'm on episode nine now. Um, I would never ever say, "Hey, 
you're liking it, you're a bad person. No, absolutely not. That's one of those things where I'm like, look, yeah. everything on HBO to me is at least watchable. It's at least for watchable. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. I just knew that one was something I was going to nitpick because I felt like the you know the game the storyline was just like so People perfect. People love that game. People yeah, go yeah. bananas for the game. I mean, it's supposed to be one of the best games of all time. I feel like it? this is tongue in cheek from Ryan. I'm not sure. I've only read book one so far. He says I never kill characters. I'm with Richard on that one. So I'm thinking he's he's being a little sarcastic. Maybe. I mean, knowing Ryan, he's probably is being a bit of a dick. <laughs> 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 to his characters, uh, to, yeah, to, his characters. Yeah, to, his, to his character, not to his, not to his mates. Um, but yeah, I've been trying to get some people I know to watch Succession because they're just like, and then like, like business really. And then they, they, they would try like to watch like the first couple, and they're like, I just didn't like any characters. And I'm like, you mean like every fucking some, grim dark fantasy book you read, where it's got you like shitty a, people and you love it? Yeah, so, I, I didn't realize show. Succession was written by a British guy called Jesse Armstrong, um, who wrote a TV series here. Uh, called peep show um which they keep trying to remake in the states that just doesn't translate well at all uh, like a lot of british um comedy doesn't translate well i think the all. office is the only one that worked yeah. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it worked because so it's interesting because the office is the quintessential example because um season one of the office the one that no one likes at the u.s yeah, they tried office, to make it like the british version yeah it's because it's the only one that's actually like the british version yeah. and uh, it is excruciatingly awkward um and none of the characters are super likable and that's very much like the british office and so when they made it and i like both of them but for very different reasons um but they keep trying to make peep show is a brilliant comedy it's basically like um you, it's these two guys who live together in an apartment they're both in their, their 20s and the they ha the camera is on their foreheads like a gopro and you can hear their thoughts like in the voiceover um and it's this it's very kind of i don't think it would jive very well with american audiences but like for if it's a very very witty very well done comedy um and the writer of peep show is the guy who wrote succession um which oh. i did not know um so that was a really interesting little tidbit for me um but i'm on season three of that and it's uh, it's very very good you know, basically the writer's strike i was like well, at least they've done filming succession you know that was that was the first yeah. thing i thought because that's like my and favorite or... show right now i i fear what it's gonna do the house of the dragon uh i know they've said hey they've already got season two written and it's like that, but they're saying like like Ryan Condal can't even be on the set while they're like, well, that's fucking terrifying because he's the one that's making sure it stays close to Georgia's source yeah. material. So I'm just like, uh, I, I take you back to 2007 when they almost killed Battlestar Galactica with the writer strike. So yeah, it's I'm, I'm the thing I'm most worried about is Andor, um, because yeah, I don't watch that crap. I, Disney's dead to me. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, no I'm Andor is Andor is exquisitely good. Um, that's why I. Hear. I, I I loved Endor, and I hate almost all. People all think them. because they beat almost. on me so bad until I finally gave Picard season three a chance, and then I loved it. That they think now I'm going to do Andor, and I'm like, oh, mate, no. See, the thing with, with with Picard no, season three is I Just wanted to Andor. see those characters again. I have no interest in any of those Rogue One characters again, besides Darth freaking Vader. And they're not uh, in yeah, it. It's only Cassian Andor who's in it. The rest of the Rogue oh. One cast aren't in it. No, it's it's really well written. You know, it's Tony Gilroy. He did uh, Michael Clayton, which is a brilliant movie if you've ever seen it. About um, have you seen Michael Clayton? The you know, movie? is that Liam Neeson? No, it's um, George Clooney. Hmm. No, I think I'm getting. He's, right. he's, he's, he's a fixer for a law firm um, in in New York. Oh, and, yeah, that sounds, um, that sounds riveting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I talked about this in high school. It was like uh, all sure. of us. We we read like several of the same authors. But we never really crossed over. It's like some of them. They, they, it's like the Tom Clancy and John Grisham guys were over here, and the Michael Crichton and Anne Rice folks were over here, or Stephen right. King folks. It was like yeah, yeah. we never really crossed over. Never so the all the wall be... stuff, Grisham stuff, was me. I was like, that doesn't sound interesting to me at all. But the guy sells a bazillion books, so he must be at least good. I've read a few. Have I read Grisham? My wife reads laser John Grisham, um, and she keeps saying, "You're a lawyer. You should. You would love John Grisham." And I was like, well, "I don't know. I I have get enough of this at work. Like I don't want to read it at home as well." <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I've read a bit of it. It's you know, it's it's good. It's it's very readable. Um, it's it's very interesting. Michael Clayton's a great movie, but Tony, it's it's done. It's the Star Wars that I always wanted, which was like a kind of gritty, realistic Star Wars. Realistic what, Star what Wars. a lot of people told me is like it's the best Star Wars show that feels nothing like Star Wars. I'm like. Yeah, it's not got like aliens in it. There's like one droid. Um, the dialogue could have been taken from like a Cold War thriller, like a kind of John le Carre novel, um, which is why I love it. You know, it's it's if I was to write a Star Wars show, that's basically what I'd have written. Well, I'm glad um, people like it. To me, what I've just said is like 
Disney's just insulted me for the last time. I just, I just can't anymore. You know, they I'm just I'm tired of them. You. It's like they're just taking this thing I loved in my childhood and just like, just hey, watch this and just, just punching it in the face right in front of me. And I was like, there's a point where I just like, I just yeah. can't do it anymore. But and or you know that should be your exception. Obi Wan was the last straw for me. I've Obi Wan was flip. I flipped tables right. during that. I was like, oh. okay, so you're gonna steal? God, I, I can't even remember what I was. It Fallen Order? Jedi Fallen Order? Is that what it's called? The EA game? Yeah, it was. I was like, so they're going to take the storyline from that, do it worse, and basically, I don't know, just do exactly what they did in The Last Jedi, but yeah, now they're going to do it to Obi-Wan Kenobi. I was like, how do you make a lightsaber fight between Darth Vader and Obi-Wan seem boring? And I was oh like, my I God, it was I so staid. I mean, I could, I could, that's a, this, I could talk about how much I hated Obi-Wan for about an hour. So that was it for me. After episode three, we just like noped out. I was like, I can't do it. We were going to watch a Mandalorian with my kid. And I think it was episode three of this most recent season. They looked awesome. like I was holding them hostage. And I was like, guys, we don't have to watch it. We don't want, they bolted <laughs> upstairs and they never asked to watch it again. So watching like, something right. shouldn't be in a, in a test of endurance, you know, um, I guess. Yeah. No, no. And was great though. You should watch it. Um, you're wrong for not watching it. it, it obje objectively incorrect for not watching it. I never swallow your, never, but I have. I swallow have, your pride. Get it I, on. I have no plan. That's what I do, Ryan. I am here to. I, I didn't tell Richard this was going to be a roast. You know, apparently this is what this is going to yeah. be. Yeah, no, it no, takes no. a lot to, to roast old Richard. I know Richard. Richard can take it. He's very headstrong. I've seen. I've seen his tweets. He, he knows how to. Yeah, handle it. I come come unstuck with those a few times. Yeah. But, so uh, uh, I, hey hey. Uh, so what do I got to do to make sure I actually get on the arc list for book number three this time? You know, so it's a really interesting story because I. I sent them a list of people. I've heard this a lot. The net yeah. galley's a mess right now. I'm sorry. They but are. I sent it to Orbit. You know, I said, but can you make sure these five people get copies? And, you know, they obviously didn't. Um, I don't know what happened there. But they did but send I always say, copy. I don't ever feel like I'm entitled to these things. Like, ever. If someone wants to send it to it's great. I think it's, I, I love, thank you so much mm. for doing mm. it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it, it, it's when, like, huh. This person's got 20 YouTube subscribers. Why are they getting the book and I can't? Yeah, well, that's it. I you sometimes I subscriber see... count matters in that regard. But it's just like well, kind of confused. I sometimes I'll see someone, you know, on, on Goodreads or whatever, and they'll have had like you know done three reviews or whatever. They don't even have like a profile picture, and I was like, how have you got one? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, is there just some button that someone's like, yes, randomly allocate? Well, I've always been um, uh, with the the Pierce Brown one, so the the, the, the new Red Rising book, because it's like mm -hmm. I think they're just completely just like throwing darts or doing like a number generator yeah, yeah. or something and saying that's how we're going to approve people because it it's makes bizarre. no sense like at all i didn't understand it i mean i know that you got one in the end which was the important thing yeah they sent you a nice hardback didn't they yeah they sent me a hardcover thank you yeah that was oh, great. there you go uh, and, i mean i, I don't have, have i don't have justice of kings on hardcover i have it on digital so now i've got to go and buy <laughs> justice of kings on hardcover. You'd, yeah i'm afraid you do yeah that's <laughs> yeah, see, right that's, that's what kind of book collector i am so yeah, yeah that's it that's it but just don't i wouldn't roll the dice on the gold spur edition um that's so, oh, so annoyed about that. You know, it sucks because uh, it seems like the UK has all of these great places like Broken Binding and yeah, Polio right. Society, places like that. And the shipping to the States is absolutely insane. It's more than the really? books. Like the, uh, the the Song of Ice and Fire Folio Society edition, $250. And you think, okay, I can finally pony up for one of those. $150 okay. to ship it. I'm like, $400 for this book? No, I'm, That's, I'm, I'm good. No, it's $150 for shipping is crazy. Yeah, well, they're heavy. They're super heavy books. Oh, I suppose they are. Because they're too so, thick hardcovers, you know? Yeah, maybe that's it. Um, I don't know why. The States doesn't seem to just have the the um, the, the, the crate books in the same way that they do I, in the UK. I feel like in the States, uh, I mean, maybe it's just because I'm so close to it. I feel like this way. Uh, less and less people read now in the States. Uh, audio booking has brought a lot of people back. Uh, they're, they're really right. into audio books, but I feel like they're really pushing hard to push everything digital here. They really are. Right. They push they push digital copies so much harder than yeah. physical stuff. And they keep trying to say, oh, That's yeah, shame. print's dying. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe. But you know, there's people like me who well, still prefer to read out of a nice hardcover right here on my desk. Well, so, I mean, so do I. I mean, ultimately, I, I actually, you know, if uh, I, I get offered a lot of arcs and I say, uh, if you can send me the hard copy, then definitely. But, um, you know, I'm not interested in reading it. I can't, I don't get on with the e-readers. I'm not really got on my laptop. Also, like, at least 50% of my sales are in physical physical copies as well. I sell I sell in the States more than anywhere else. Mm. It's all about 20 or 30,000 books in the States. And um, half of those are, half of those are physical. Oh, flex on them. Flex on them. That's good. Who does your audio books? Uh, who narrates them? Yeah. Lucy, Lucy Patterson. Um, have you listened excellent. to him? Are you satisfied with it? 
I did. I did indeed. Um, it's a weird. It's a weird one listening to someone read your own words. Um, I had to kind of almost train myself to be able to in- endure it because uh, she was doing such an excellent job. I was almost like getting embarrassed. I don't really know why. It's a weird. It's a strange feeling to describe. Um, but I have listened to all of the first one, and maybe like two thirds of the second one. Um, and she's she's excellent. I couldn't be happy with her. Um, you know, she's. Do you fantastic. have any feedback on on that? Like like how to pronounce characters' names or anything like that? Do you give any feedback do, on that? I do give her a um a pronunciation guide. Yeah, because I don't think she did much fantasy reading before. I look at her back catalogue, and it's mostly like you know thrillers and, and things, and just kind of you know regular fiction. Um, and so I did have to kind of give her some audio that's my dream job man audio feedback yeah um that's i think the book to three, set up a nice studio in my house and record audiobooks that would be my dream yeah job. You, you could know, do like, well, oh you should you should submit something i'm like i have a real job i can't you, yeah you should read matthew mcconaughey's autobiography i think you would be a dead ringer for that huh. all, right. That kind of like, all right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of texan kind of the yeah. Yeah, um that. But yeah, whatever the, stereotypes is, there are for you know, and this is something Jay Chris pointed out. Whatever stereotypes there are for Australia, apparently Texas has a lot of the same stereotypes that, that just people. Who yes, think well, I um, out here. Oh, I I've heard Australia referred to as British Texas, which yeah. I think is um, exactly bang on. Like it's just it's the perfect description of the country. It's is if if the UK had a Texas, it would be Australia um, without the guns. Um, I think this is a great closing question, and I'm going to just. I'm just going to tell myself I'm just so great for asking this. Well, not really. <laughs> uh, I think that I have heard from a lot of authors I spoke to that they don't like to read anything else while they're writing. Are you that type as well? I um, It's interesting. I don't read a lot of my contemporaries anymore. Um, so I won't read books by like a lot of authors. Ryan Cahill? Are- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly won't read his books. Goodness me. Um, I tend to avoid like, you know, the current milieu of fantasy authors. Um, I don't really know why. I guess I feel like I just want my voice to be my own and I don't like to be distracted by what other people are kind of putting out there. Um, and also, to be completely honest with you, I've, I've just I've never read a lot of fantasy. Um you know, I've never been a huge fantasy reader. I've always been a bit more of a science fiction reader. I'm probably reading the most fantasy now that I that I ever have done. Um, a lot of that comes in the form of arcs, but I'm going to put the brakes on those for a little while now because um, I don't like to read out of a sense of obligation. Um, it's not as enjoyable. Well, I see. That. It seems like you guys are like a like a club now. I just like assume all of you know everybody because I like not just because like I see like your blurbs on each other's books. I'm like, hey, these are all authors that I read, but like. Now I see yeah. on Twitter, like they, you all interact with each other. I'm just like, wow, this is like a, it's like a nice community of, of writers. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's wonderful. And you know what? I, I'll read a book. You know, I read a book by uh, an Australian author called um, Tim Napper um, called 36 Streets. We went to a convention together and I bought his book and I read it. And it was like, it was just a one, it was a brilliant book. It was so good. It was one of my favorite books of last year. And so there's nothing better than, I say I don't read my contemporaries, but when I do read one and it's an excellent book and you happen to like the author, then that's a really wonderful feeling. And then you can kind of, you know, have a conversation about it. The sun's coming through my green screen. Of course not. It's under attack. I know. Oh my God. Ah! <laughs> you guys have read the, star by star. That's what's going on right now. It's the purge of the Jedi temple. Um, and the same thing with um, Chris Buhlman's yeah, between two fires, which was my favorite book of last year. Um, which is just a brilliant, brilliant novel. Um, so there's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a really wonderful thing to be able to kind of um, read a book of a writer that you uh, you, know, you admire and you respect and you're able to just reach out to them and say, hey, by the way, I thought you did an excellent job with this novel. Um, and then you can have a conversation about it. And that's really nice. I really like oh, that. Oh, sure. It's great on my end as well. I mean, the fact that I'm like, I'm messaging you while I'm reading your book. To me, that's just like <laughs> yeah. the coolest thing, you know? Oh, it's I, awesome. No, I love it. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Um, I guess the difference is, of course, is that you might hate my books. Uh, one oh, day, I mean, yeah, they're, they're then, atrocious. I mean, I don't even know how to make it through them, you know? I mean, our friendship will end immediately with immediate effect. No, well, see, well, the difference is, is like, uh, for example, uh, Chris Ferracchio, Sun Eater books, it's like I'm texting him while I'm reading his books so he can explain it to me like I'm five because I don't understand <laughs> the things that are going on. I, I, for the most part, I think I think, I think think yours are pretty clear, you know? But uh, I, I still am like, okay, Goodness Richard Red Dune, he said, how do I work the voice into my story? <laughs> I am here. You know, for- do you know what's interesting is that 
that actually wasn't the inspiration for the voice like it genuinely really? wasn't no it wasn't and and it's weird because i do love june june um and it was i uh, and I, as i said i own multiple copies of it but it's not it, it, when i was coming up with like the magical powers for a justice i was thinking like what would a magical lawyer like want and it started with the power to basically force someone to confess the crime to you. So like using your, mm. so like it was this idea of like le what I termed like legomancy, like legal magic. And it was like, and because modern ad modern lawyering is all about advocacy in the courtroom, I was adding a magical element to ad uh, oratory essentially or advocacy. And so that was the root of the voice. And then the voice became not just a tool for extracting the truth, but also a tool for commanding people to do stuff like throw a sword away. So that's where the inspiration of the voice came from. But me, 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 multiple people have been like, you took this from June. I was like, I actually didn't. <laughs> I mean, and, and I don't, I didn't have a problem with it, not admitting, talking about my influences because we all have them. I look like I'm missing half my head there. Um, talking about my influences because that's just part of being a writer. We all have them. Um, <laughs> And I'll and I'll happily discuss them, but uh, but the voice d does not come from from Dune. That was a completely you know, separate font of inspiration. All right, so one last go. topic, and then I'll, I'll let you go rest right. your voice. Uh, you brought up Between Two Fires. I'm seeing other people asking about uh, fantasy authors or horror authors switching to fantasy. What I said when I read uh, Hellmouth by Giles Christian, which is very mm. similar to Between Two Fires, right? They said, "Why does it seem like medieval horror is not like a?" bigger thing because oh my mm. god it goes together so well now and when, after i said that i was like oh your series is kind of starting to lean that way so is that is that like a thing like horror writers are switching to fantasy is that what's going I on i don't i i think you know it's interesting because i think i don't think historical fantasy or historical fiction is necessarily as popular as fantasy but i think it's because as soon as you bring anything into the real world even if it's got a fantastical element to it it has to follow certain rules <laughs> and so you're, then you're you're following. God, I don't know what is going on with this green screen. I look like I'm slowly dissolving <laughs> into the ether. Um, you have to forgive me. I look like I'm missing half my cranium here. Um, and and so you're 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 playing. You're then you're working to a playbook at that point. You know, no matter how loosely, you're you're still constrained in some way. Um, whereas pure fantasy, you can make it whatever you want. And I think that's you know, that's the difference between say I'm I'm going to write like a, a a piece of fiction that's in that's set in tudor england well immediately then you have to adhere to what actually was happening in tudor england you can't just then say i mean you could put dragons in it sure but like you know everything else has to be a base level of technology social sociological advancement and all the rest of it but in a pure fantasy world you you because you are asking the reader to come into a world you have invented completely um they have no idea in which direction it's going to go in and so therefore the, the suspense is, is greater and the tension is greater. Um, I really enjoy the horror elements in the Empire of the Wolf for me came in because I wrote the necromancy. I wanted the because the necromancy was such a useful tool in finding out who committed a given murder. Um, I wanted the energy cost or the barrier to entry for that skill to be very high. And so otherwise the book would be the narrative would be too easy. And so I made it horrifying, literally horrifying. So Von Volt, yeah, he sure he could find out who murdered a person, but to do so, he has to basically get give himself PTSD. Um, and so it it evolved from that. And I loved, and as I said, I, I loved Wayne Barlow's Barlow's Inferno, his artworks of hell. Um, there's a few other artists who I've been inspired by, and I love that kind of idea of hell, or certainly the afterlife being a real place and being populated by real kind of eldritch creatures as for other as for other authors like you know doing it I'm, to be honest with you i'm not sure um i'm not sure why it's not more prevalent i think the horror elements in the empire of the wolf are some of people people's favorites favorite parts of that that series i don't think it happens necessarily a huge amount um i think that also, being able to see like their last thing that they saw kind of thing before they died is such a neat idea i love those yeah things. yeah yeah, I think it's that. great. It's yeah, like a sort of snapshot into the, you know, the final state of your brain before you pass on. And I've got ideas as to kind of where to take the afterlife in subsequent, you know, books and, and series. Um, you know, which I'm pretty happy with. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know why it's not more you know prevalent in fantasy. I guess it's just just 
hasn't had its. It was just one of those things where I was like, I didn't know I needed this in my life. Now I need more. But I was like, yeah, I yeah. like those two. I was like, well, there's not really much else out there. No, 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 there isn't. That, so. There isn't. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure why. I guess there are there are a couple of books that have done it so well that um, maybe everybody else is just playing catch up to those books. Um, you know, you've got a, maybe if you've got a few books that are kind of dominating the space, and I mean, once you've read Between Two Fires. You think, well, do I need another medieval? Right, right, like, yeah. You know, kind of, I've kind of checked because it does it so masterfully. Uh, uh, historical fiction. I read some Bernard Cornwell and I tried to read some else. I was like, it's not as good as Bernard Cornwell. I was like, maybe I should have started, <laughs> yeah, well, started with him. Yeah. It's exactly the, that's exactly my point. Like you read Christopher, Chris Bullman and you, and, you, and you think, what a masterfully executed novel. Like I'm, I've, that's scratched that itch, you know, forever now. It's, um, yeah. you know, I don't need to read any more medieval fantasy. Oh, can I? Well, I want to thank you for playing through the pain. I appreciate this, man. It's really, really Surprise. good. Uh, after for me, if I, I had a cough after about the twentieth time, I said, "Like, <laughs> I gotta go, man." But you yeah, know, no, I'm sorry. I, I was appreciate more that. annoyed that I was just coughing into my microphone. I was trying to uh, mute it with my hand. It's okay. Um, it proves that you are not an android. You know, I mean, no. Because sometimes we got to wonder you, with your writing output if you are uh, absolutely made human. I so, was the cyborg cylon in the Battlestar galactica board game which i don't know if you've played but it's uh it's a great fun game have you, so you haven't watched game? Battlestar galactica but you know what a cylon is okay i do know a cylon okay i'm genre savvy mate come on um <laughs> <laughs> but i was the, have you played the board game it's really good i have i have the red rising board game and i haven't even opened it yet because no, no, no. get know. the Battlestar galactica board game what happens is i'll tell you very quickly <laughs> you'll get a character you get the ship whatever it's called is it called the Battlestar galactica is yes. The ship is yes. called. Yeah. So you're that's the that's the game board, and then two of you secretly get given a Cylon card. So as I understand it, they're, some, they're mimics of some kind. Well, you you the whole thing about the series is like who's the Cylon, who's not, because they right. look like yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the that's the conceit of the board game as well. So two of you are Cylons, and what happens is you all have to make decisions, and you vote on a decision, and you all vote on them anonymously and simultaneously, and then but if you're the Cylon, you're actively working against everyone. So you're, 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 the cards that you throw in are like basically trying to sabotage the vote. And then everybody has to guess who the Cylon is. And you get like every round you have to guess. And I was just like, it was a really good fun game. I was well, see, I've been with my wife since 2007. And she, <laughs> no matter what board game we play, she absolutely destroys me on it. So I just stopped playing. Yeah, them. yeah fair enough. It's just like not fair anymore, you know. To the point where I just like accuse her of cheating because there's no way you would think like statistically I would dumb luck my way into winning one, you know. But I statistically, I would think that you're right. All right. Well, thanks so much, man. I can't wait for a book thanks, three, Mike. no matter what it's called. I can't wait to hear what it's called. I can't wait to see that cover art. And uh, uh, it's going to be a good time. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for your support and for your reviews. Appreciate that. Of course, of course. Happy so to shift help. a few hundred, hundred copies just by yourself, I, I'd say. Well, that, that's great. That's awesome. I love to hear that. Word of so, Mike. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good man. I well, yeah, I gotta give thanks to Alan. Alan's the one who put it on my radar first. So, and then I no, mean, here's the thing: Alan's like, "Hey, you gotta check out this book called Just Like oh, Okay." I have to listen. I saw the cover, and I was like, "Oh shit!" Yeah, I gotta read Martinez that. Martinez yeah. done a wonderful job. I did my first interview was with Alan. It was a really wonderful uh, experience. Alan's something. He's a great guy. Yeah, he's yeah, a, yeah, he's a good guy. He's a character. Let's put it that way. All right, guys, <laughs> thanks for hanging and uh, buy his books. There, follow him on Twitter. Very funny. You'll get to hear hot takes about Star Wars and, and Mass Effect and Lord of the Rings. Correct and takes. Yeah. Great. And I don't call truth. What sports do they have out there? Like dwarf tossing? I don't even know what sports they've got down under. You know? This is mostly rugby, four different variations rugby. of rugby, rugby. And, uh, and cricket. Okay. Yeah. Cricket. All right. Yeah. Hey, maybe he'll, get, he'll throw some of those at you guys. You'll learn something new. It's so, like, all right, guys. Have a good evening. See ya. Thanks.